today is the last day of webinar series at this time and uh, today we have arranged BSKM subject for the webinar presentation. We have a presenter here with us now. He has about 27 years work experience in Sri Lanka and at present he is a national head of sales and he is working as a group managing director to the head office and uh, it leads to local com conglomerates and currently manages his business schedule as a management consultant for several blue chip companies in Sri Lanka. He is handling in specialized professional body This was experience on issues management and neg negotiation skills. He acts as a key facilitator for specific industry negotiations with governmental bodies and is responsible for strategizing winning business plans for leading business public sectors organizations as well. He is a graduate from the Institute of Chartered uh, Chartered Institute of uh, Marketing UK and he has MBA from University of Colombo and at present he is reading for his PhD from the University of Colombo. He is Mr. Asoka Bandara. Now my request from you all as strategic level students please make use of this time for the maximum benefit of your examination work and get through the examination. This is a business strategy part and for the uh, knowledge management part there will be another presenter. Asoka, it's your time. Yeah, thank you there. So good afternoon everybody, uh, those who are here as well as who's not here, who's probably connected to us uh, in many places. Uh, we have exactly one and a half hours, so we need to manage our time well. Because time management is also a strategy, isn't it? It's a strategy. Uh, so today we will be discussing a very interesting area. I think you will be quite uh, interested to know about strategy. You will have read a lot about strategy. First, I must say I am going to use today, because of lack of time, uh, some of the chapters that you have already have with you. So certain sections of these chapters I have highlighted. You may see some being highlighted. So uh, I'm going to use your text because strategy there are so many books and textbooks and uh, these textbooks are more or less the same but there are subtle differentiations. But we are not going to get in, involved in arguments on strategy today. So we'll be using your text which is given by CA. And I must say the book that you have with you, the text that you have with you is excellent text. What it does not have is more details, but I think if you use this text for your exams cleverly, all of you will get very good results. That much I can guarantee because I went through this text once, that's all I had time today. So I went through it once and I realized the text that is given to you is in very good condition. So I'll give you some tips how to uh, face the exam before I start. Uh, this being a strategy paper or partly strategy paper, you have knowledge management also, am I right? Knowledge management also. Now I give one tip to all my students, particularly I teach at MBA level. So uh, I myself is a student, I am studying for my PhD. So you can see at any stage you can learn, even at this age. Uh, so, in my work as a management consultant at a train, I come across strategy every day. Strategy is part of my life. I am sure strategy is part of your life. All of us require strategy. There are different names, but I mean, today you are listening to this lecture or the webinar. You had a strategy to come here. 
those who are listening into us today at various places, you have a strategy. Otherwise, you won't be there. So it's as simple as that. Strategy is part of life. Now, one tip I can give you, all the students who are listening to us, is that when you go for this exam, particularly strategy paper, do not go as a student. You know what I mean? A lot of students, they get scared when they see the paper and they get nervous, which is natural even. I, I still get nervous uh, when I see a new paper. It's, it's, it's natural. But especially strategy, if you want to give good marks, go to the strategy paper like a manager or go like a consultant. You are going, you are getting a challenge in the exam, you are getting a paper with problems. Now don't think, my gosh, did I study the Porter's five forces? Did I study the Ensource matrix? Did I do the BCG matrix, G electric matrix, right? My diversification strategy, now you don't get confused. Most of the examination questions, if you really study it, it is practical questions. I mean, they are asking great questions. Uh, there's a company or there's a public sector organization. Uh, it is a going concern. It has some issues. So you can see some problems or some opportunities. So what are you proposing? So all of you, I'm sure, one day want to be first class managers, CFOs, CEOs, COOs, I mean, whatever you name it, or to run your own business, isn't it? Or to do consultancy, like what I do. So, when you do this, your job will be to, every day you will be getting certain issues, certain problems, and you need to have certain solutions. Well, uh, in corporate level strategy, you are not only doing solving problems, you charter the future of the company. You design which way your organization should go. Before coming to that, when you go for the exam, go like a veteran, go like an expert. And then this paper will look very easy. If you go like a student, you know, my gosh, I have not studied this part, I have not done this part, I am going to, you know, I, I'm, I have forgotten the whole thing. Don't be like that. So look at the problem as a professional, which all of you can do that. Look at the problem like a, uh, somebody giving solutions. Then you will start seeing the theoretical side. You will start seeing my, this problem. I mean, I'll, I'll give an example. There are four ways of doing things. You remember the Ensoff's matrix. Good old Ensoff. He said it long time back. Now, there are four ways of doing things. Remember the matrix, the four quadrants. In your mind picture, I want you to mesh, rem remember these four quadrants. What are the four quadrants? On one side, you have products. You can either sell products or you can sell services, correct? On the other side, you have the current market or you can have a new market. That's all you can have. I mean, even if you are talking about interspace, selling interspace, uh, you can have this earth, you can have other planets. You can have the products today, you can have the products of the future. These are the four variables. So either you have today's products, or today's services for today's market. You can have today's products, today's services for another market. Correct? You can bring in some new products. I believe this webinar is a new initiative. CA, it's a new initiative. It's a new product, but catering to the existing market, isn't it? You are the existing market. They can also cater this to the international market. So these are the four strategic options available. So when you see a business problem, maybe the case study, maybe a question, look at it that way. Don't be theoretical. Don't be theoretical. First, try to understand the concepts, basic concepts. What's happening in this organization? Is it doing well? If it is doing well, the question is, why are they doing well? A lot of us, when we are doing well, we don't know why we are doing well. Take the Sri Lankan cricket team. Right? When we are winning, we don't understand why we are winning. Then when you are losing, you scratch your head and try to see what went wrong. So remember in strategy, especially when you are doing well, when you are on top of the world, when you are a market leader, understand what are the critical success factors of your business. Why am I successful? Then you will start seeing, I'm just giving general, general things. Still, I'm talking not 
to the text, I am talking very generally. Then you start looking at, they say in English language, there are chinks in your armor. Now remember recently uh, this unfortunate thing happened, Phil Hughes, uh, let me use a little bit of cricket, all of us are cricket fans, am I not? Phil Hughes, um, good cricketer died because he got a ball on his neck, even with the helmet. So likewise, there could be certain chinks in the armor, there could be gaps in your body suit. So when you are doing well, there will be weak areas, there could be weak areas. So understand certain areas in your business, in your portfolio can be weak. Remember to cover it. If you don't cover it, what will happen? Somebody will attack it. That is the way. Somebody will attack it. So when you are doing well, I always tell people to do their SWOT analysis. Remember the SWOT analysis? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Now strengths and weaknesses, from where is it coming? Strengths and weaknesses, generally speaking. Say I will take him, he can probably uh, lift 200 kilos, right? So his strength comes from within him, a lot of practice, right? So he get that strength. He can do that, but if I ask, you, ask him to run 100 meters, he will take 30 seconds. Usain Bolt takes 9.5 seconds. So he has a bit of a weakness in running. He's good in weightlifting, right? So that is his strength and the weaknesses are come, coming from within you, it is inside you mostly. Now where are the opportunities? It is generally coming from externally, threats also coming from externally. So when you are looking at a case study, look at it like this. When you read the case study for the first time, I would recommend I, uh, to lack of time I will be very brief on the case study. But when you get the case study, your paper has a case study initially, small case study, not small but moderate size case study, read it once. First time when you read it, can, you can start underlying few points, right? If you see a strength, put a S there. If you see a weakness, put a W. If you see a opportunity, put an O. If you see a threat, put a T. Now first time the chances are you will find only few. So how many times you, then you should read the case study once again, second time. Then this picture will become clearer to you. Right? When you read the case study the third time, you will start seeing the issues, you will start seeing the problems, you will start seeing the opportunities and then you can start formulating your answer. So when you see the case study, do not get paralyzed, but do not analyze too much. If you analyze too much, you will be running short of time. So manage your time, but I would recommend any case study to read it three times. Well, some people do it once. In my case, I need three times. Because when you do it for the third time, generally uh, I also design case studies. When you design case studies, you put some subtle points, small, small points. Examiners are very good at doing that. If you read it only once, you may miss these subtle small tricks. When you read it twice, it will become clearer to you. When you read it third time with a very clear mind, you will see it like a good picture. So remember this on the case study, right? Then again on the questions, I always tell the students, when you go for the exam, which question should you tackle first? The most difficult question or the easiest question? Easiest. Why should we tackle the easiest question? Yes? Because you feel good. You feel good about it. You first tackle the easier ones. Keep the tough one towards the last. But being a strategy paper, you need to have a strategy, you need to have more time to tackle that difficult question. Generally, I had seen a lot of management students, what do they do? They take the easiest question, your paper is three hour paper and you take one and a half hours for the easiest question, you write a nice essay, you write everything there and then you realize there is no time. So do not do that. So I think in your mind, picture yourself, take some of the past papers, you have the past papers, 
you have the model answers also. So I think if you go through these past papers and the model answers, this exam or for that matter any exam is not a surprise. Because as you can see in your, I went through your syllabus briefly today, it has a certain nice framework. So the questions will come from within this framework. They can't ask you a question or we can't ask you a question outside the framework. So what you should be doing now, for those who are here, those who are not here listening to us, when you are reading these chapters, some of the chapters are here uh, highlighted, certain areas which I will explain very, very briefly. When you see, when you read these chapters, don't read it just like that. For example, what is corporate level strategy? This is your first chapter, if I re recall right. Now you give a definition of a corporate level strategy. They say the corporate strategy over here, I'm sure some of you can't see, but you will know what this chapter is. Corporate strategy is a firm's overall approach to gaining a competitive advantage by opening several businesses simultaneously. Right? Now when you read this in your textbook, you should think in your mind, how many companies do I know like this? Don't read this sentence like this. Do I know any company? Am I, if you are working, is my company like this? Or is my company a little different? Maybe my company is not very much corporate level strategy. It's more operational level. It's more at a tactical level. It could be that. So I think you need to see that always when I, I recommend students, when they read something, think of the question, the reverse psychology. So when you read, for example, what are the challenges of a corporate level strategy, don't read like that. Examine is going to ask you, outline, uh, take a certain company, maybe Singapore Airlines. Uh, what do you think based on this, the challenges for Singapore Airlines? He's going to ask that question. He's not going to ask, give you the answer. So when you read, what you are reading in your textbooks are the answers. Are you with me? What you are reading are the answers. Now don't look at the answers, think of the question. Because they cannot ask a question outside this. So it's a bit of a reverse psychology when you are studying. If you think of the question when you are reading something, what sort of question can they ask me? Can they, can they ask a question like this? For example, let's go a little down here and see. Right. I'm still on the first chapter. Right. Uh, it talks about uh, vision, goals and objectives. Right? So when you read about vision, goals and objectives, then you are reading about these five points, the resources, businesses, role of corporate office. So there are five points here. Now, can, how, what can the examiner ask you? If there are three points, he can ask you what are the three points in this. So when you read this, you know the question and you know the answer. I'm telling this over and over again because this technique has worked for a lot of students. Ask the question from you and in all your books, some of the books, there are questions also asked in the end. Summary, the book is a summary, it gives you the scope. Because what I am telling this, if you do, if you read your textbook properly, uh, in with a lot of depth, twice, thrice, this will become very clear for you. And it's easy to remember because it's all in very short form. Right, so these are some of the points, remember. Case study three times, question minimum twice, any question should be read minimum twice and you should do the preparation for this exam now. If the exam is on the 26th, 26th, correct or 27th, 30th, so there are a lot of time, a lot of time. So if you, you need to have a strategy how to face the exam. The time is adequate and if you separate this into the various, various sections, I am sure that you will be quite ready for the exam. So I think uh, best of luck for the exam. Now we go into a little bit of an understanding some of these theories very briefly uh, before I start tackling few questions. Uh, this chapter says resources constitute critical building blocks of strategy because they determine what a firm wants to do but what it can do. Now take any organization. <coughs> take your organization if you are working. How many of you are working here? One, two, three, virtually, yeah, okay. So some lucky people are not working. <laughs> I like to be like that. 
whatever you are all working on, you have awareness about uh, your organization. So think of your organization. What are the resources my organization has? What are the resources my friend's organization has? Now, if I'm working for a construction company, for example, right? You are an A-grade construction company. Maybe who's my, who are my competitors? Do they have more resources than us? Do they have a strategic advantage having more resources than us? So always try to benchmark. That's why I said don't read anything just for the sake of reading. In strategic management, it's comparative. Compare. You always need to compare. Remember the word benchmarking? Benchmarking. So in business, I say this is a bit of a joke. Life is not a, uh, I mean, what, all this is nice theory, what we are studying now, right? This is nice theory. But where are we going to apply this theory? Is it inside this nice hall with nice comfortable chairs and air condition? No. We are going to use this theory outside this hall in the natural environment, right? So it's not an artificial, it's not a vacuum flask. You know a vacuum flask? In a vacuum flask, the tea doesn't get cold. Huh? It takes a long time. But in real life, outside, business is very complex. So you need to always benchmark your organization, your business with the rest. If you don't benchmark, you'll be like in the classical frog in the well. So in strategic uh, analysis, always, if you are doing a SWOT analysis, a lot of students do one mistake, big mistake. I used to do the same mistake when I was a student. We do the SWOT analysis for ourselves. Say you are competitor A. Say there are three competitors, competitor A, competitor B, competitor C. Your competitor A, your company A, sorry, you are not a competitor, you have two competitors. You have a market share of 30%. Your business which is 30% of the total industry business. Now you do a nice SWOT analysis for yourself, beautiful SWOT analysis. That's your business horoscope. I call it the SWOT analysis, the business horoscope. It's better than any horoscope because this is more specific. Stars, we don't know where the stars will go. But this business horoscope, you can predict. So you do this SWOT analysis and you go to sleep. Is that correct? You should do a SWOT analysis for your competitor B. You should do a SWOT analysis for your competitor C. Why should you do that? Because, ladies and gentlemen, while you are running your business today, while you are strategizing, your competitor B, your competitor C, are they sleeping? They are not sleeping. They are thinking all the time, when am I going to get this business? How can I get this business? 30% market share, I want that business. I need to desettle this business. I need to gain share from this business. I need to attack him. I need to have aggressive strategies. Maybe I need to have defensive strategies. I need to have flanking strategies. So while you are planning, they are also planning. So they are looking at your strengths. They are looking at your weaknesses. You should also look at their strengths. You should also look at their weaknesses. We do this in military planning. Strategic planning. I think word strategy is a military word. If you go through all the historical uh, documents, you will see strategy has been used in warfare. Warfare, which is 5,000 years old. Right? So I think in strategy, in warfare, you should always see what are the enemy's strengths, what are the enemy's weaknesses. In business, we should know what are the enemy's strengths, what are the enemy's weaknesses. So you do the SWOT for yourself, but please do the SWOT for your competitors. Then you will start thinking like your competitor. Your competitor will think like this. Ah, this company, they are weak on their product portfolio. You remember portfolio analysis? VCG matrix, G matrix and all that stuff. Companies have various portfolio. You have a portfolio theory in finance, isn't it? Portfolio theory. So they will look at your portfolio. This portfolio is a very old portfolio. Not updated. Not contemporary. Little old fashioned. Right? So they will look at that portfolio and realize you are not a very innovative company. You are not a very modern company. So what will they do? They will come up with absolutely innovative contemporary products to attack you. Whereas if you do the SWOT analysis for your competitor, you will realize, ah, 
their portfolio is one step ahead of us. We have first generation products, they have third generation products. You will realize what they are good at. So I think remember all these things is comparative in strategy, it's comparative, do benchmarking. Now coming back to the corporate strategy, who designs this corporate strategy? The word corporate strategy sounds pretty impressive, no? So basically corporate strategy is done by which level? Lower level, middle level or the top level? Yes? Generally it's done at the top level. So I ask you another question. I hope this is not an examination question. Two people in the top level, do they know everything? <laughs> I can see the expression. Right? Well, they can't be knowing everything. So I think this is one of the limitations of corporate level strategy. The top level, they know a lot, but they don't know everything. No boss knows everything. Then he can't be a boss, he's Superman. Right? So I think uh, you see here in the corporate level strategy, how this started was long time back. Your book says that it started uh, with the advent of the railroad, with the telegraph in the 1800s, right? There's a little bit of history here. And then after that, uh, the organization started expanding, uh, where you can see the road infrastructure started. And uh, more importantly, the diversification started in the 1950s onwards. <coughs> if you see the 1970s, the word conglomerates came. Now, what is a conglomerate? Conglomerate. From a conglomerate word really came in the 1970s. You need to remember this word. <coughs> Sorry. By the early 1970s, the emergence of a new type of a firm, the conglomerate with no co-business. That means they have not one co-business, they have many businesses. Many businesses. There are certain businesses which is from A to C or C to E likewise, conglomerates. Any conglomerate you can name in Sri Lanka, which has a wide spectrum of businesses, a wide array of businesses, without any bias, you know. So John Keels is seen as a conglomerate. No, John Keels holding is seen as a conglomerate because they have wide array of businesses. Haley's is seen as a conglomerate, two strong conglomerates, also competitors, I believe, right. So there's a conglomerate. They have many, many portfolios. And then what happens in the late 1990s and also contemporary, you had this ability, you had this phenomena of downsizing. People are expanding, expanding and expanding. And now you see this focus is on downsizing, outsourcing and refocusing. Now, when you are small, your teacher used to tell you always focus, no? Because when somebody is teaching, you can always look like this, but you can focus on something else. I used to do that when I was bored, when I was small. So I think in business also you need to focus and you need to refocus. Because why should you do that? Now I'm asking you some questions. Why should you do that? Because the business landscape, is it constant? It's not constant. It keeps on changing. It's like the political landscape. Political landscape is not constant. It keeps on changing. Economic landscape is not constant. It keeps on changing. Likewise, business landscape which is a combination of the economic landscape, political landscape, these things keeps on changing. So what you designed five years ago as your master plan, it may be completely redundant today. So you need to revisit that. So you need to refocus. Remember that word. Then I need to draw your attention to, this is on your page number eight and nine in your textbook. There are many approaches to corporate level strategies. If the examiner asks you, what sort of corporate level strategies that you, you, you want to use? Uh, the book gives you three areas. I want you to remember these three areas. So when you make some short notes, make some short notes, you know the decision tree, you guys are good in this, the decision tree, likewise the decision tree or the fishbone diagram, draw it that way. Always rely on drawings. Uh, sketches and diagrams. It is far more powerful than writing things. Even in the exam, if you can draw something, I believe examiners give you one additional mark. A sketch, a diagram, a plan is very impressive. So I think growth strategy is one. 
on the growth strategy we have to discuss many many strategies you have the stability strategy is the second one third one is defensive strategy three strategies what is the first one growth strategy that means growing the corporate plan is to grow the organization second plan is not growing stability stability means you need to stabilize the business all businesses cannot grow right businesses can sometimes may not grow can go into a bit of a decline you need to make it stabilized then there may be certain businesses which is really going down if, if that happens you need to have defensive strategies not offensive strategies but defensive strategies so these are the three broad corporate level strategies remember that so when you are studying study study along along with you may get a question maybe a certain companies depending on the situation examiner may ask you what sort of corporate level strategy that you will recommend for example i'll ask you now this is hypothetical i am thinking about a question here if i am your examiner i may ask a question for example i'll give you an uh, example of a certain company take for example uh, a bookshop take a bookshop there are many good bookshops in sri lanka no now whenever i travel i don't travel much but when i travel i had seen the best bookshop in chennai is on the verge of closing down the best bookshop i used to visit in singapore is already closed down these are fantastic bookshops i used to spend hours there i have seen bookshops in australia closing down right what is the reason there's a bookshop called on the web you know the name amazon so how do you compete with amazon so if you are in the bookshop business typical bookshop business can you compete difficult to compete so your model should change so in a situation like this before you start talking about a growth strategy probably you must first do the stability strategy you must stabilize the business otherwise no investor will come to your business right they will downgrade you you guys are finance people do this so i think you need to first ensure the business is stabilized that's what you call a stability strategy so examiner can ask you a question like that or maybe there's a certain company take uh, something like uh, mining business mining you know mining you go down and start mining now those days mining was all labor intensive today when you do mining it's all automation you can go 1000 feet down without a single person robot technology robotics right so in a in a situation if you have a mining company which is labor intensive however much you try however much we try it will not work this morning i was discussing with a certain company chairman he was telling me for a certain uh, production line he used to use 56 people and now he has done automation from uh, chinese machinery which requires only 8 people so can you imagine from 56 people it comes down to 8 people but he is a very sensitive person he said i need to look for some jobs for these people that's another issue in automation don't forget in strategically machine is only one but there are human beings human beings so i think remember if you are in a organization like that maybe the business is falling apart you need to go into a retrench re retrenching strategy liquidation strategy which is a bit of a more than a defensive strategy no winners you need to either sell it to somebody or to liquidate that company that's another strategy so these are all high level strategies which are called corporate level strategies clear so three strategies what are the three strategies growth strategy stability strategy defensive strategies very good so let's hope to get a question on this right and then let me see we will now discuss uh, again i am on the text strategic options at corporate level we are still on the corporate level this is from your chapter 2 Now we were discussing growth strategy so let me come to that uh probably uh, this is the maximum i can increase on the uh, computer uh, so bear with me 
uh, but you have the textbook with you so you can read this. So under the growth strategies we have quite a few, diversification is one strategy, concentration integration is one strategy, strategic outsourcing is another strategy, market penetration, market development and there are few more, few more, oops sorry. They are all together seven in your book, yes correct. Product development, strategic alliances. So I think when we study the growth strategies, remember these seven points. So in your fishbone diagram, again one, two, three and these one growth strategies can be split into seven areas. That is how we should study, then you will remember this entire framework. So under diversification, these things you have done a lot I am sure. You have product diversification and you can have geographic diversification. Product diversification means you may, you can bring new products, new businesses, new industries, very simple. So do not, when you say product, do not think only of products, think of services. In fact, the services business is probably bigger and better than some of the product businesses. So do not ignore the services. And the other one is geographic diversification. You sell in Sri Lanka, you go out of Sri Lanka, you go to India, you go to Bangladesh, you go to Switzerland, you go to Sweden, right? The world is your market. So that is the geographic diversification. So you can diversify two ways, remember product wise and geography wise. Uh, now you can do this, the corporate diversification, single businesses, you can do it for single businesses, you can do it for dominant businesses. You can do it for related businesses, you can do it for unrelated businesses. Again this is very simple, it looks very theoretical, it is not theoretical, right. You have a, you can, you can expand the, ex, you say for example you are in that bookshop business, you expand that business, single business or you get into CDs, musical DVDs, videos, that is another business. Then you get into the ebooks. You start having a bookshop also on the net, ebooks, right? You start, so that is another business. So these are multiple businesses. Uh, or you can go into related businesses like these books and albums, or whatever it is which is related to bookshop, you can go into something totally different. For example, uh, can you think of something different uh, for a bookshop? Printing is related, no? Printing a book is related, binding books is related. But if they get into, for example, manufacturing uh, sausages or something, completely different business. There is nothing to say that they cannot manufacture sausages if you are running a bookshop, right? You have to make up our mind. So I mean it can be totally unrelated also. So keep that in mind and then I want you to remember this word. Related is called concentric diversification and unrelated means conglomerate diversification. So make a, some memory point somewhere. If you get the question on related diversification for the exam, it should come to your mind related diversification, concentric diversification means related products. If you get a question on conglomerate diversification, you remember the word conglomerate. We explain conglomerate is more than one type of business then that is unrelated, more, conglomerate is always more, right. Now here the goal of unrelated, goal of I am sorry, the goal of related concentric diversification is to obtain the benefits from transferring and leveraging distinctive competencies, sharing resources and bundling products. Now when you are in a certain business you have certain competencies, you have certain resources, you have certain experience, isn't it? You have done it for a long period of time. When you do something for a long period of time, you become an expert. So that knowledge, now I take this bookshop, it is a very simple example. I like to take simple examples, not complicated examples. The bookshop can easily get into printing or start getting into the production of paper, remember the word for this one, some sort of integration, your textbook talks about backward integration, going back, 
then they talk about forward integration going forward these are options backward integration forward integration will come to that will come to that but I want you to remember these things in your mind so this is not rocket science these are very simple things right you take automobile manufacturer so Sri Lanka I think we are assembling some vehicle uh, one company is assembling cars so today they are bringing parts and assembling cars but who knows tomorrow next year year after they may start manufacturing the part, parts maybe the engine maybe the doors windows part of them will start manufacturing so that is going backwards they they are going forward today because then you need to have the showrooms right go to their showrooms or go to somebody else's showroom to sell a car so backward integration forward integration these are options available in a business or you say I am not interested in backward integration I am not interested in forward integration my business is very focused I am only good in doing what I am doing today. I do not want to cloud my mind. I do not want to bring new people. My cost will go up. I have to learn it from scratch. This is a difficult area. Why do not I give it to somebody else? You can outsource. You can outsource. Now, in most offices, it is very difficult to find a tea maker, no? somebody who makes a cup of tea. Most tea makers are outsourced. You can outsource it. Janitor, you have a nice office. It's a great office. Who cleans this office? I'm sure there's somebody doing the janitorial services. You can outsource certain things. So non-strategic areas, non-strategic areas, we can give it to somebody else. Maybe that person is specializing on that, and that person can do it cheaper for us. So we should focus only on the critical business areas. That's the concept of outsourcing. Right now, coming back here, the concentric diversification is a related diversification. You can leverage your co competencies. What are co competencies? Things that you know better, things you are really good at. You can share these activities and you can pool your negotiating power when you are talking to the suppliers because you have a set of suppliers of the earlier business and this is related business. So, when you are negotiating, you can say, I give you this business. I give you this business, I am giving you extra volume, so give me a better price. It's a good bargaining power. So these are the pluses. I don't know whether you read, look at this nice chart, nice graph. I am always fascinated by these graphs. This is uh, probably in your page. Anybody can see the page here? Page 4 or 5, right? Look at this uh, graph. I think it explains beautifully the low levels of diversification. Moderate, this is here on your left side, the low levels of diversification. On the right side, the moderate to high levels of diversification. So this is a company which is diversified, but not too much diversified, right? On your right side, there's a company which is diversified. You can see these uh, connections coming here, and at the bottom extremely high level of diversification. These are individual businesses, no connection. Multiple portfolios, multiple SBUs, independent businesses. They are handled like a separate company, right? highly diversified. Now you should think when you are, re when I am telling this, is that a plus or is that a minus? Having too many businesses on your portfolio, they have no connection with each other. I very different. So for example, if I am short of labor, I can't take the labor force from here, I can't put them here. These guys have one set of skills, these guys have another set of skills. I need to bring new labor for that. Is it a plus? Well, it's not a plus, right? But what happens if I take here one of these businesses, say I think you are into, uh, for example, you are into food business. That is one business. Then you are into uh, construction business, second business. Third business, you are into uh, travel business, inbound travel, outbound travel, which is more service. Right? Your construction business comes down because in this country, I think uh, there is so much of construction now happening right? after the post-war situation and uh, great construction is happening, but after five years time, all the buildings have come up. 
Now, no more, nothing to build. This is hypothetical, right? It's not reality. But what could happen to a construction business? Maybe the business potential in Sri Lanka will come down. Then you need to look to go to Maldives or maybe to go to India, maybe to some other country. Whereas your travel business, now we are hitting uh, almost 1.5 million tourists coming to the country. Maybe it will exceed 2 million very soon. It's a good sign for the country. So your travel business is really booming. Now if you depended on your construction business, what will happen? Company will go down. Now you can hedge. Remember hedging? We do hedging for oil, right? Oil hedging. You heard about the word hedging, covering yourself like an insurance. Covering is a bit of insurance. So if you have uh, too many portfolios, the advantage would be if one portfolio goes down, another portfolio can cover it up. That advantage is there. So these are the pros and the cons. I mean, this is all explained in your textbook. But when you are reading this, get into your mind. Examiner can ask us, for example, what are the exam what are the advantages of having a single business? What are the disadvantages of having a single business? What are the advantages of having a multiple business or a diversified portfolio? What are the disadvantages of having a diversified portfolio? These are the type of questions he can ask. Right. So the book spells out many points, advantages of conglomerate diversification, which is unrelated diversification, and the disadvantages of the conglomerate diversification. Some of the points, very few points I mentioned. If you go through your textbook, many points are given. Many points are given. The question may be on to your right side, what are the reasons for diversification? One point I mentioned to you already, if one business goes down, right, another business is there as a cushion for you. There also could be obsolescence. What is obsolescence? Going out of fashion. Now, all of you are living in absolutely virtual society. Now, today you are listening to me on this webinar. Who knows, five years time, the entire lectures will be like this. So that you will be very comfortably in your houses. I am comfortably in my house. We are talking to each other. Then I don't have to get dressed up like this. Isn't it? So technology is changing a lot of things. Education, the way we are doing business. We are going to cashless society. Remember the last time you used a check? Wrote a check? I can't remember. Now you, sw you are swiping plastics. People don't handle much cash these days. Isn't it? So, things are changing. What happened to the Sri Lankan postal office? Post, po, post office? When was the last time you sent a mail to somebody? Sorry, sent a letter to somebody. Apart from the Christmas card and the Vesak card. Nobody. Right? So, today, grandmothers are texting. Grandfathers are texting. They are on the net. Correct? Which is good. So, things are changing while I am talking to you. So when things are changing so fast, obsolescence can sit in. Now your business can get old fashioned. Therefore, you need to diversify. That's another reason. There may be, uh, there may be uh, competitors coming and then damaging your business. Then you need to diversify. You probably you need to focus on a certain area that you know very well. So likewise, please go through your text. It gives you many reasons for diversification. Right? And also it tells you the limits of diversification or the disadvantages of diversification. Uh, now, if you get a question in the exam, why do diversification strategy fail? Why does it fail? Many diversification strategies have failed. People have expanded businesses. People have bought new businesses, gone into new areas, but they have failed. What are the reasons? Can you think of some? Why should this fail? Because we put a lot of effort lot of energy, lot of capital, recruit new people, all that. In, in spite of all this, diversification can fail. Why? That's a probable examination question. Why should it fail? What are the reasons? Maybe, maybe you really don't have the core computers in the new area. You are a cash rich company, you buy another business, you get into another business, but you don't have that experience. 
So be careful when you acquire a new business or when you diversify, it is very important to think of two things. One is the resources. When you say resources, people is a very critical resource. Technology is a resource. Process, remember the process. Process, you have to acquire the new process, right? Watch more. What else? Experience, all these things. So if you lack these things, however potential the business looks, furthermore, when you go into a new area, there are competitors. So what will competitors do when a new competitor comes? They attack. They will say, no, no, it's okay, he's a nice person. We'll let him get 10% of our market share. Do they think like this? No company thinks like this. I don't think you think like this. So when a new competitor comes, the attack is very great. If you can kill, I, sorry, I had to use this word. If you can kill a competitor early, it's good. So there will be so much of intensity to block you. So the diversification strategies could fail due to that. So the book gives a long list of uh, reasons. It's good if you can go through that as well, right? Uh, I will write, I will only read this part. A company should pursue unrelated diversification. What is the name for un unrelated diversification? Conglomerate diversification. When its distinctive competencies are highly specialized and have few applications outside the core business, when top management possess super strategic capabilities. Now, if you want to diversify your top management who is handling the corporate level strategies, their capabilities must be world class. They should have multiple skills, multiple skills, not just one track skills. So in an organization which is highly dynamic, where the top management is extremely versatile, you should be diversified. But if your top management is extremely focused, Specialized in one way, say for example, you are a medical firm, you have a group of private hospitals, it is run by all doctors, right? Now the same set, if they go into the share market, maybe they will do well, maybe chances are they may not do too well. Because they do not have that co competence Some doctors are good business people though, uh, with uh, uh, no offense, but you see they, they are good in one area. But that does not mean they are good in all the areas. So these are some of the reasons you need to think. But there are certain organizations which is extremely, inter they are not depending on each other. They have so many SBUs, food SBU. Uh, I mean, take an organization like Reliance in India. Read about Reliance, the two brothers, right? Uh, read about Tata. These are some of the examples you can pick up for best uh, diversified companies. If you take Tata in India, Oh, difficult to find a business that they are not in today, probably not space. I am not sure whether they are into space, uh, probably they are into space. They are into everything, they are into food, they are into uh, cars, they are into automation, uh, Titan watches, it's Tata. And some of the best cars are owned by the Tata. Range Rover, Land Rover, correct? Owned by Indians. So it's, you can see the way they have diversified. But I can tell you they are not diversifying in a crazy manner. They are diversifying in a very strategic manner. So in a highly diversified company, the business managers have to deliver. They have their separate PNL. They run it independently. It's what you call the SBU structure, strategic business units. So SBU is a self-sustaining unit. They have their own PNL. They need to go to the bank and borrow the money from that PNL. So they are running independent businesses. You can't be asking money from Next to, I am short of little money, can you give me a small loan? You can't do that. They are independent. Skills are different. So these conglomerates, large conglomerates, have ma managers with this multiple skill. Right, remember that part. Look at these two charts. Kirby linear relationship between related and unrelated diversification and firm performance. As you can see here, this is y-axis. This is the x-axis, correct? This is the performance. When you are a single business, your performance keeps on improving. You focus. And then you go into related uh, diversification. Your business further improves. But after some point, you can see this is the 
this is research based, uh, this, this chart is not just drawn, it is based on research. And when the business become unrelated, what happens here? After some time, the curve drops, performance drops. So remember, do not over diversify, but do not focus on to one business also, if you can, right. So it is not a, it is not a solution for all the problems, right. So you keep this in mind. The second point is integration. Now we discuss this is these are still part of the growth strategies. Growth strategies. Second point is integration. Now under integration, you have these words vertical integration. Under vertical integration, I want you to revise this chart. If you look at this chart, ladies and gentlemen, the chart I am circling here, your entire integration, uh, your vertical integration theory is revised. You can see here, I would strongly recommend you to draw this chart. Please draw this chart before the exam, then you will remember this. Companies today here, they are doing the final assembly, right? And if you manufacture something, uh, take a company like uh, Cargill's today, Cargill's retail or Apico, right? Take Cargill's, they will take Cargill's. Gidrayana Gama, Cargill's. So when Cargill's today are supposed to be buying their vegetables from the farmer, they send their trucks to faraway places where the farming communities are and they buy their fruits and vegetables from the farm. I, I understand John Keels, uh, Keels are doing the same today. Most retailers, uh, big retailers are doing that. So they do a bit of a backward integration. What is the advantage of doing that? Yes cost. How does that advantage come? Now I want you to remember the concept of value chain. Remember the value chain concept. This, okay, there is the supply chain. Okay, let me go to the supply chain. Then the, we come to the value chain. But somebody has to produce this vegetable. Farmer has to produce it. Right? And then farmer has to process that. And then farmer has to give it to a certain middleman. The middleman has to transport it you need to find a transporter. Maybe he gives it to a bigger middleman. And then from Luarelia or from Rajangane or from deep south, the goods have to come to central Colombo. So what Kargis is doing, what Kills is doing today, they have their trucks which is servicing all these supermarkets in various places. These trucks can go th take the goods in, but when they are coming back, they can be empty. So the same truck which is going with the goods to the stores can come back after picking all the vegetables and the fruits. Isn't that a better way of doing things? Otherwise you are transporting, yeah, halfway. So that is backward integration, is very nicely integrated. And by doing this, they are eliminating some of the middlemen. And every middleman probably makes 5%. If there is a wholesaler, if there is a retailer, semi-wholesaler, whatever it is, direct dealers, you, in the chain, more links you have in a chain, the markup has to be given. So what they are doing is they are going directly to the farm and picking it. So hopefully they can sell the vegetables 10 or 15 percent cheaper than the rest. So is that good or bad? Good. So backward integration. Now going to the forward integration. Take an organization like uh, Singer, Apico. Now Singer into a lot of electronics. Damro, I'm using Sri Lankan examples because we are all Sri Lankans. Uh, Damro, they are into furniture, they are into electronics, various things. And where are they selling these things? Mostly, their own showrooms. So they have a retail network which is here. Distribution and retail, they have their own network of. I mean, in India, I had seen some of these uh, outlets. They have more than. 10 or 15 outlets in India, I believe. So is it a good thing? Is it an advantage to have your own outlet? It is because you control that outlet. So that is the forward integration part. See, very simple. So when you are starting a business, either you can be in the middle, you do what you do, or you can go backwards, start some of the supplies by yourself, packaging material by yourself, and also start distributing the product by yourself. You create a channel. You create a channel, you create a value chain and in your value chain or in the supply chain, you are in control. You can change things. That's a superb advantage. But 
it is costly. And if you do not have the skills here, if you do not have the skills here, what will happen? That advantage will not come. So, you must learn the basics first. You should know how to procure, you know, you should know how to have a store, how to manage a store, the working capital, the circulation of the, the inventory circulation, all these things you have to master apart from your current business. So, this concept of backward and forward integration has its advantages. At the same time, when you are studying this, look at the disadvantages. If you want to cut cost, if you want to focus on your core business, you do not have to go backward. I can tell you uh, now if you take multinational like Nestle, they produce milk, they collect the milk from farmers. Bit of backward integration, but not 100 percent backward integration. Why do I say that? They, if they have their own farm with cattle and all that, then it is full backward integration. They do not have farms. They go to the farmers like Cargill's are doing and they collect the milk and bring it here. And to distribute their products, they have their own distribution network going forward, which is covering 100,000 odd outlets in the country. So, that is forward integration. So, the entire value chain up to a certain degree is there. Whereas, if you are manufacturing uh, Lamborghini cars, those days Lamborghini is a hot topic, right? Thanks to Dilan Malagamo, I saw him on TV today. I think he is, a lot of people do not talk about him. He has won quite a few races internationally. So, uh, what sort of backward, in, do you want to go for backward integration? I do not think you need to do that. Should you go into forward integration? No, because Lamborghini cars probably you need only one showroom for a country or two showrooms. So, it all depends on your product, it all depends on your service. But generally, fast moving consumer goods, a uh, lot of consumables probably follow this route. So, uh, it is not a prescription for every single product, right. So, that is about uh, backward integration and forward integration. Then you have something called vertical integration, do not mix up the two. Lot of students including myself mix up the two. So, I think you need to be very clear in your mind backward forward integration which is part of the horizontal integration correct uh, or vertical integration. I am testing you okay vertical integration. Now, I am coming to concept called horizontal integration is, which is in your page 13 page 13. So, backward integration is either going forward or going backwards. What is horizontal integration? Your book says horizontal integration strategies expand in the organization's operations through combining with other organizations in the same industry. There are some, so many other organizations within the same type of industry doing the same thing that you are doing. It refers to a strategy of seeking ownership or increased control over a firm's competitors. Mergers, now should, this should come to your mind, I am connecting this, the mergers, the acquisitions, takeovers are basically part of the horizontal integration, right. So, horizontal integration is very apt or very suitable if it enables the company to meet its growth goals, it can be strategically managed to attain a sustainable competitive advantage and also in certain countries, especially where mergers and takeovers are concerned. I think Sri Lanka, we are not that tough, but if you go to states, US, USA, the merge, there is a, there's an antitrust court, there is an anti-mergers court. Very strict. Sri Lanka also it is coming, but in the western countries, you just cannot join like that because they like to protect the other players. Imagine two giants merging, right? all the small players can vanish. So, you need to have the sharks, you need to have the small sprats also in a perfect competition world. So, keep that in mind, but look at this chart in your page number 15. Again, I draw your attention to this chart. You have given this diagram about full integration and there is another called taper integration. What is taper integration? Taper integration means or tapering of not the full integration, it is part integration. So, you have this option whether to integrate fully or to go into tapering integration. Uh, outsourcing, give me an example of good outsourcing. 
Sri Lanka we have a lot of outsourcing businesses no yes BPOs BPOs is outsourcing if you go to India you will see that's a huge business huge business Sri Lanka also it's coming up nicely strategic outsourcing so why should you outsource what is the reason for outsourcing why why should you do this why can't you do it by yourself examiner may ask you why should you outsource why don't you keep it with yourself you are in control now what are the outsourcing then you need to think what are the outsourcing are they outsourcing the critical parts or they outsourcing non critical parts so probably outsourcing it's initially it's good to outsource non critical parts but don't be surprised ladies and gentlemen very soon there will be virtual companies sales will get outsourced marketing can be outsourced finance very easily can be outsourced production can be outsourced so company is a virtual company somebody else is doing everything company in the center it makes money virtual company so don't be surprised this model will come if the model is there in certain countries but in sri lanka also this model will come so there's you don't own anything somebody else is doing something you you are like a symphony orchestra conductor he doesn't play an instrument no this conductor you know do all this he doesn't play an instrument but he keeps it going so these models are possible today because of the technological advancement technological advancement you can see here outsourcing some companies uh, in this company research they have research and development they have production marketing and customer services so what they have done is they have realized for this organization this is your page number 16 the first diagram r and d they keep it within the organization because r and d is confidential that is classified that is your proprietary knowledge marketing and sales they want to keep it within but the production function has been outsourced and the customer service has been outsourced i doubt whether it's a good thing to outsource the customer service sometimes because uh, if it is a complex product i would rather give the customer service within the organization but not a complex product you can outsource it so it, it depends it depends and then uh, what is a strategic alliance these are many many growth models you can see the growth uh, under we discuss seven we are not going to do all seven for lack of time a uh, strategic alliance a strategic alliance is a voluntary long term cooperative relationship between two firms two companies designed to achieve a specific objective so they are it's not a it's a partnership but they are two separate companies but they work towards one objective many multinational companies for certain areas of business they have strategic alliances because imagine two powerful companies fighting on the same market place with two competitive products there can be no winners so they can go into a strategic alliance and say this area geographically we will cover this area geographically you cover you share the profits rather than fighting with each other that could be a strategic alliance this and then you can have joint ventures you can have licensing agreements give me an example for licensing in sri lanka pepsi coke also has licensing bottlers most of the bottlers have licensing arrangements franchising give me an example you people must be going to these places every week kfc <laughs> mcdonalds all fast foods are generally on the franchising mode so these options are available options are available uh, your your textbook talks about the advantage of franchising disadvantage of franchising uh, all these models i think you need to see the pros and the cons if you get a question on that i think you can then tackle it easily right now we were discussing so many growth strategies now to conclude this part let me talk about the stability strategy we discussed three broad strategies one is growth second one is stability third one is defensive so we come to the second one very quickly now stability strategy can happen let me what are the types of stability strategies one is pause strategy pause process with 
cautious strategy. You become very cautious. You do not take any unnecessary risks. Some organizations pursue stability strategy for a temporary period of time until the particular environmental situation changes. You remember we had a 30 year old uh, civil unrest in our country. Now during this time, some of the investors did not come. Certain foreign companies who were invested in the country, they, will, they were not investing further. Why? Because the landscape, the political, the national landscape was very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. So in a situation like this, you really do not invest too much. You focus on what you are doing. You do not do too many, too many things. Because you, it can change virtually overnight. I mean, imagine a country like Egypt. You remember what happened in Egypt, thanks to the Facebook and Twitter, right? Iraq, some of the countries are going through it today, what we went through for 30 years. So this sort of unsettlement, instability, will force, will force some of the companies to use these strategies. A no change strategy, you do not change any of your decisions, you just continue to do what you are doing it. Do not change too many, do not experiment too much. A uh, third one is profit strategy. You need to read on this. The profit strategy means that you are losing money, right? So you need to, uh, especially uh, financial people like you, you need to make sure your books look good. So uh, what you do to save the profits, you sell some part, right? You gain some money, right? Uh, you're on a very short term basis. There's a technique called salami technique. Now, do not write about that. Salami technique is that if you take a salami, you know salami like this. So, if you want to cut cost, you start cutting the two sides, salami. So, somebody says, no, cost is too much, you cut some more. You keep on cutting the two sides and cutting, 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 finally there is no salami. <laughs> so, do not do that. So, profit strategy against, but you may have to use it because the business is losing money for five years at a stretch. What do you do? You need to get some relief. So maybe you, some area where you are not making any money, where you have no co-competence, you can sell it off and take that cash. So these are some of the stability strategies because the marketplace can be extremely volatile, war situation, natural disasters, imagine Bangladesh, everyday floods, stuff like that. There may be certain countries where you have to be a little careful rather than be too ambitious. But Bangladesh has good business though. So I, probably it's not the right example. Maybe some of the African states is a better example. Right. Now finally, we come to the third broad strategy, retrenchment strategy. These are very defensive strategies. Now these are last resort strategies. I don't want you to start thinking of retrenchment strategies as a habit. But who knows? In your career, you may come across huge challenge. This is the ultimate challenge. You may come across a certain company and you are, imagine you are the head of finance there and the company is not making money, right? Not making money, losing money month after month, year after year, quarter after year. Your shareholders are becoming impatient. They need a return, right? They need a return. So what do you do? In a situation like this, there are four strategies. One is called the turnaround strategy. There are turnaround specialists. There are people who can take a company which is at a very low level, not making money, and they have the ability, they are called turnaround specialists. They have the ability to bring the company up to this level, up to this level. Company should be up to this level, but company is right now at the bottom level. So these turnaround specialists, what do they do? They will, it's like a surgeon removing a cancer or a tumor they will take a scalpel and they will cut, chop. They will cut the fat. A lot of companies have unnecessary fat. They cut the fat and remove the fat. Some of the people can be removed. I mean, you remember this great Jack Welch of GE, General Electric, world's biggest company. He took a decision. I forget the year now. He took a decision one day. He had about 300,000 people. One day he said, I took a very tough decision. I had to retrench about 25,000 people. So people asked Jack Welch, were you able to sleep properly after that? 
He said, it's a very tough decision I had to take because these are good people. I have to fire them not because of their fault, but they were excess. And the company was not doing too well. But for me to save my 300,000 people, I need to let go of these 30,000 people or 25,000 people. Of course, they were given a good package and all that. But sometimes in businesses, ladies and gentlemen, we have to take tough decisions. Now, to take this turnaround strategy type of decisions, you have to look at it in a very objective manner without much emotion. Right? Because if you don't take these tough decisions, company will go down the drain. It's finished. Right? So, you need to have a lot of moral courage here to do this. Well, uh, I don't know what is fair, what is unfair, but company has to be saved. So, therefore, one strategy is the turnaround strategy. Other one is, I'm following your textbook, divestment strategy, you give, you give part of the business away. Business is quite a big business. Maybe business has four sections. Two sections are not making money. You sell it off. Give it to somebody else to run it. Right? Or lease it out. That's divestment. Like a divorce. You know? Even if that, if that doesn't work, what do you do? Finally, finally, you are going to liquidation. Sell the assets and settle somebody. And if liquidation also doesn't work, you have to appeal for, you guys know this, <laughs> bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. I think it's important in life, sometimes you have to be sensitive for these things in strategic management. Because strategic management requires good leadership qualities. You can't be soft. You can be kind, but you can't be soft. Because you have to take decisions. When you take decisions, you have to take objective decisions. So sometimes, if you take decisions from the heart, these decisions may not be very objective. So you need to take the decisions from the heart as well as from your head, both. So don't take decisions when you are taking strategic decisions only from the heart. Take it from the head also. Use the heart, but use the head more importantly. Right. Now, these are the, uh, what we discussed up to now is basically uh, on the strategies, uh, three broad strategies, corporate level strategies. What is the first one? Growth. Under growth, we discussed there are about seven points. We could not go through all seven. Then we discussed stability strategies, which is basically business is not doing too well, but business is not bad, but we need to keep it going. So you survive for another day. You, you know that you are patient. Things will improve tomorrow. Things will improve tomorrow. So till this unsettled period passes through, you survive. Then third one is more the defensive strategies where the business is really going down, right? So uh, go through the, your BCG matrix. This part I will skip. These are more theoretical part. G matrix and also book talks about uh, corporate parenting. These are three basic uh, basic uh, models. But one point I should tell you for the exam, when you are going through these matrices, don't be very dogmatic. Now, those who are working, I would recommend to draw the BCG matrix for your organization. Maybe your organization has only one type of portfolio, but there may be various products in that portfolio. So you can see which type of product is more of a star, which one is a problem child, which one is a dog, right? There are quite few no? dogs. Which one is a question mark, right? I mean, this is, this is very simple. This BCG matrix, when I teach it, G matrix, I always say, think of a family. It's like a family. You have four children, right? When you have four children, some children study very well. Some children don't study, right? Some children are question marks. <laughs> But still your children. Some children are stars. Right? Some children can become cash cows. Right? So look at it from that point of view. Only difference is that for a parent, we have corporate parents also, like parents. You have a corporate parent. Now, unlike you know, for parents, especially mothers, all children are equally important. But in this business, this is where we differ. Uh, however much you are linked or emotionally attached to a certain product. In this analysis, if you find, for example, a dog, 
doesn't have much of a future, don't drop it, don't drop it, keep it, but don't invest. Just take some money, squeeze it out, squeeze it out, uh, try to extract as much money as possible from that, but don't think that dog is going to revive. That again requires a very tough decision, tough call, right? So that's on the BCG matrix. If I, if you get a question on BCG matrix and the difference between the G matrix, this one, what is the fundamental difference between these two? On the BCG matrix, uh, you basically uh, talk about two axes, business attractiveness, right? What are the two axes in the BCG matrix? Let us go to that quickly. Yes? On this side you have the industry industry attractiveness or the industry growth rate and on this side you have the relative market share. Now are you going to take a decision on your business by the, these two factors only? No way. You have 4 SBUs, 3 SBUs are doing well, 1 SBU is in this position, in this quadrant. Just by telling industry growth rate is coming down, simply because your market share is not picking up, you do not throw the baby with the bath water. They say throw the bath water but do not throw the baby with it. So wait. So BCG matrix is at a glance, it is like your rough horoscope, right? <laughs> business horoscope. Now you go into the detailed business horoscope which is the G matrix. If you go to the G matrix you will see that as per your theory what you have learned to calculate the industry attractiveness I think you need about 10 or 12 points. You have to give marks, actually you have to calculate the on the log basis, logarithm, you have to give ratings. To calculate this, this, uh, this one, this, this one, you have another 12 points or 10 points. So altogether you are using multiple factors to calculate. This is why G matrix is very difficult to calculate, you need a lot of information. But if you make that calculation, your finding is absolutely correct. You can decide which products to invest which products to divest, which products or which businesses require partial investment. Because ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, none of us will have unlimited budgets to run our businesses. So as CFOs of tomorrow, you need to decide where to put the money. So you must put the money where the potential is high, right? But there are certain businesses, you may not have the money, but do not kill it, keep it. It keeps on giving something, take the cash cows. Without the cash cows, you can't have the stars. Somebody must make the money. Cash cow gives you so much of money, that money you can invest behind the stars. Or part of the problem children, question marks, you can pull it to this side. So think strategically again here. That is important. So is the corporate parenting, right? So this concludes the part on your section 1 and section 2. I think you have some more time or your yeah, time is up. So basically uh, coming back to the exam now, coming back to the exam, uh, okay, so we, we will now conclude, we will now conclude. Uh, coming back to the exam situation, I think what we discussed today, we could only finish part of it, but we finished two important parts. We, we finish the, your first section and your second section which talks about corporate level strategy and there is bound to be a question from this area. Now as we discussed, what I would recommend you in conclusion is that when you go through the text, when you go through your question papers, you will also see the theory, lot of questions are coming from the theory and in fact when you read the model answers, Lot of students have not understood the theoretical concepts, that is why they have lost marks. Examiners keep on telling this, student has not understood the Ansoff's matrix properly, has not understood the Porter's five forces. So I think be very clear of yourself, what I would recommend under this strategy part, if you go through these four sections, section 1, 2, 3 and 4, it revises your strategy absolutely well. You do not need any more textbooks, you do not need any more, you do not need to read anything more, but go through it because this has been compiled very well. But when you read it, as we said at the beginning of the lecture, do it in such a way, think of the question, do not think of only the answer. 
and revise it. And when you are revising something, think of an example. Because in the exam, in the exam, most probably you will get a question from a company, or you may get a question where they will ask you to give an example. What is the best example you can take? The company you work for, or the company that you know. If you are not working for any company, there are millions of companies on the net. We want to see the best of the diversification strategies, best of the mergers, best of the joint ventures. Go to the Google and just type 2014, the best mergers. You will have the answers. So make use of the technology also. Right, our time is up. So uh, I thank you very much for your patient hearing and wish you all the good luck at your exam. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mandara. You have done a wonderful job by delivering this webinar presentation. And now I want to introduce another webinar presenter for the uh, knowledge management part of the subject. Uh, he is here with us now. He is uh, graduated from the University of Colombo and he has worked as an instructor in mathematics in the same university. Uh, he obtained his master's degree in computer science from the same university. He is a member of computer society in Sri Lanka, uh, possesses several work experience. He is a visiting lecturer, worked, worked as a visiting lecturer in business maths and information management in CS Sri Lanka. He joined public sector, uh, public service as, a, as an assistant director in 1994 through competitive examination. He currently serves as a director in the Ministry of Highways, Ports and Shipping. He is Mr. Matararachi, Dhammika Matararachi. Not from Matara, but the name is Matara Raj. And my request from you, the same like last time, make use of this time with him for the maximum benefit of your examination. Mr. Matara Raj, the time is yours now. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Basically, I have to cover chapter 5, 6, 7, 8 and, uh, seven, eight and 9. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, this is a little bit uh, technical and uh, uh, this computer based one, maybe it will be tough for you. But uh, I will try to explain uh, uh, these things in this half, one and a half hours. And I will try to show some last three question papers, last three times, that means two times in last year and this year, June. Thank you. <coughs> Basically, uh, chapter five is, uh, I will go through the total thing, uh, technologies to manage knowledge. Uh, what are the technologies to manage knowledge? That is chapter five. So you have to understand about these technologies. Then the next chapter is called uh, knowledge uh, elic elicitation. <coughs> what is this? Uh, how to convert uh, our knowledge into systems, right? So those are very important. Then the third, third, the seventh one is uh, chapter seven is uh, data mining. Data mining means how to uh, store and analyze all these things in using these computer systems. So then you have to go to 8, that is knowledge management systems, right? What is knowledge management systems? Uh, there are three types of systems we will discuss. After that, what is the future of the knowledge management systems? This is totally in your book, right? Only five, five chapters. 
So, you have to understand these things in very clear manner. If you go through first one, uh, technologies, uh, technologies uh, for the manage knowledge. Uh, basically, there are three, uh, three uh, knowledge management uh, technologies introduced in your book. Uh, first one is artificial intelligence. Uh, it's here artificial intelligence, digital libraries and repositories. There are three types technologies introduced in your book. They may not ask about beyond these things because this is technical things. Uh, I think uh, you have to confirm to the book, right. So, if you go through past papers, each and every time they ask same kind of questions. I think it is easy if you understand this one. So, basically what is this artificial, uh, artificial intelligence? This is very important today paper, I think uh, Daily Mirror, yes, there was, a, there was a statement about this artificial intelligence, this challenge for the um, intellectuals now because systems are manipulating everything and nothing to do with uh, <laughs> these people, but not uh, there is a challenge. What is this? What is this art word artificial intelligence? It says in this book it says artificial inte intelligence is the science of providing the computers with intelligence somewhat closer to the human. Now, computers are machines. So, we are trying to give human brain into the computer, right. So, what is this knowledge management? Knowledge management, we are going to manage the knowledge. What is knowledge? So, if you consider accountant, accountant's knowledge, bookkeeping, making all these things, that is accountant's knowledge. It is not different thing. It, it's, it's a different thing with the doctors. Doctors, they have their knowledge that is medicine. If you go to lawyer, they have their knowledge. If you go to engineer, they have their knowledge. How to keep all these knowledge within in the system and how to manage with this system, that is our knowledge management. The artificial intelligence is, it says that the, this is a science, providing the computers with intelligence somewhat closer to the human brain, right. So, how to do this one? We are discussing those things. How to do this thing? This word. We are expanding this word in this section, right? What is this? So, if you go through this one, simply it is an attempt to simulate human intelligence in computers, right? You are going to try to put all this into computers. Artificial intelligence provides ability for the computer to come to a conclusion through reasoning based on a pre-configured knowledge base, right. So, what is the relation in between artificial intelligence and knowledge management? 511 in your book, what is this? The artificial intelligence is an area where knowledge is stored and manipulated. Now, knowledge is there, you have your knowledge. With respect, with respect to the accounting. So, this, this says artificial intelligence is an area where knowledge is stored. Now, you are going to store this your knowledge in the, in the systems, computer systems, right. But uh, your knowledge is your experience and uh, you uh, time to time it change, huh? then uh, it will become a little bit vague one if you consider one by one your knowledge time to time change right so how to how to store this kind of changes it's very difficult if you have a structured one very easy to put it into the computer if you have a storage type things very difficult to put it into the computer a structured ones numbers that is very easy to put it into but this is now if you consider our knowledge how to store and manipulate Right. Therefore, having an idea about artificial intelligence technologies will help you to understand different technologies that are used to manipulate and use knowledge. Right. So, this is very very important section. First one is storing knowledge.
what is this story knowledge now you know about artificial intelligence right we are going to we are, we are going to use computers as human brain right so then now we are going to do uh, storing process how to do this one storing and manipulation huh? storing and manipulation with this one the knowledge is intangible in its original form you know that i told you it's so like a story intangible your knowledge it's like a write up right it's a thinking how to store this one this is very difficult thing to handle it using computer systems and use it for various knowledge based computer applications the knowledge needs to be converted to structures as i told you now this story is this, this this kind of uh, uh, intangible things you want to convert into structural things then is it put into structures structures that can be stored electronically in your computer can you understand what i am talking yes i think there are various structures where knowledge is stored such as rules and frames right i am not discuss all these things in detail if you go through this book you can understand that kind of but i will find our pin points right so then where I, where I can you store these things so stored knowledge is used by knowledge based systems we will come to that one this stored knowledge is used to used by knowledge based systems we will come to that one right then if you go to so we have limited time to cover all this what is this knowledge based system artificial intelligence is broad area therefore we will try to discuss one by one what is this knowledge based system knowledge based system we are going to store knowledge in the knowledge based systems what is this huh? the knowledge need to be captured acquired and then stored or represented in a form of suitable for the use of particular knowledge based system yes now you want to keep all this knowledge for example say accountant you want to capture his knowledge first then acquire so you are telling something as a computer man he is writing all these things you have to capture then acquire huh? acquire and then store in the computer then store in the computer system Repre or represented in a form of suitable for the use of particular knowledge base what is this knowledge based systems which provide intelligent decisions by referring to a knowledge base and working on a problem using inference mechanisms to come to reasonable solutions about the problem what is this now what is this knowledge based system now you have your knowledge accountant's knowledge or doctor's knowledge engineer's knowledge lawyer's knowledge so we are we are going to capture all these things into the system so what is this knowledge based system the knowledge based systems it provide intelligent decisions it process these things right for example say someone come here and put it into some question in this computer what is this accounting theory so computer system automatically says by considering that input knowledge and some formulas given into the computer it automatically says this is the answer maybe write up that's 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 why this challenge for the intellectuals the computer says answer no need uh, expert now because computer says if you have a intel intelligent system artificial intelligent system it says this answer not from the expert but we all collect all this capture all this expert knowledge and put it into the computer this system is called knowledge based system can you understand what is knowledge based system right so just if you go through past papers they are asking this kind of questions what is knowledge based system and so and so try to understand so then this it says the acquisition and storage of knowledge acquisition and storage of knowledge forms a knowledge reserve here called knowledge base that acquisition and storage that is called knowledge base i think you are clear about knowledge base huh? okay all these things are in your book please go through this book at least you have to write down these things in your answer answers as the questions are with some some case studies and other things if you can't uh, relate all these things with the case study at least you write down these things 
then examiner may can understand you, you know these areas. Uh, so at least these definitions. Then <coughs> I will go through the knowledge representation should be done where the knowledge is compatible to be accessed by an artificial intelligent software system for reasoning process. This is very simple. Now AI system will understand all these things and give your answers. Anybody can find anybody can query a question to the computer and computer gives answers for all these things. Computer has AI system, artificial intelligence system. If you go through the internet, now lot of things are, I will come to that one, lot of things are based on AI systems, right. Now this is very important, I went through the last two, three papers, this diagram, yes, they may, they may ask about this question, maybe 2013, last year. Components of the knowledge based system, components, uh, if you go, to, I will take question papers also at the same time. Huh? Yes, this one, 2000, 2013 June, this, this diagram. So same, same thing in the book, right, this is the answer, model answer for you. Uh, components of the knowledge based system, knowledge acquisition, first one is knowledge acquisition, this one, right. Then knowledge base, knowledge base, right. Then inference mechanism, inference mechanism, I will discuss these things, inference mechanism. Then knowledge output, knowledge output, intelligent output, right. This is the answer, just components. At least you have to write down these things, right. So then if you draw this diagram, then it take, you can obtain more marks. This question, question is a, yes, if you go through question 4 of the 2013 paper, question is about uh, part B of the question, in order to improve the services level of the ABCA, explain the ways that a knowledge based system can be used. To explain your answer, consider the components of KBS, components of KBS, these, these four, right, and explain two potential uses of relevant KBS components within ABCA, potential uses. So those are explained in is like this, uh, I will come to that one, this is a case study. So you have to understand this knowledge, this uh, knowledge based system components, right. Then if you draw this diagram, you, get, you can get full marks at least, right. Then yes, knowledge is a description about the world, knowledge base is the module where the knowledge relevant to a particular problem domain is stored, right. What is this acquisition mechanism? I will discuss one by one. What is this acquisition mechanism? If you go through these four components, it is in your book, very clearly mentioned. Sometimes you have discussed, sometimes they may ask about this one, acquisition mechanism. Acquisition mechanism is the way the knowledge is acquired for the knowledge based system. Now I say, the accountant is there, so you want to acquire the knowledge into the system. Now, acquisition mechanism is that, very simple, simple to understand, just write down this one acquired for the knowledge based system, you, we are acquiring your knowledge for the system. These are not actually uh, figures, and the knowledge is uh, you know that is like a story, you know. So very difficult to put it into the system, that is why now acquisition mechanism is, so you have to acquire this knowledge and put it, even in doctors or lawyers knowledge, we have to put it into the system, right, that is called acquisition mechanism. The humans learn things from the daily en encounters of their life, that is called experience. You are gaining your experience day by day. So you are going to collect all these experience, put it into the computer, right. In, the, in a similar way, the knowledge based system also need to learn things. The system also day by day, they want to update their systems by putting all this knowledge, by adding all this knowledge. There are various techniques that facilitate knowledge acquisition for a knowledge based system. Those acquisition mechanisms will not be discussed here because it is too far, too, too much for you. Just you have to write down these things. At least you have to understand about the acquisition mechanism, right? Thank you. Then inference. That if you go through the diagram, next step, the next component is knowledge based. Then 
we already discussed about knowledge base then inference what is this inf inference what is this inference now we have acquisition mechanism we have knowledge base what is the inference now we 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 put it all this knowledge into the system inference is inference is the process of deriving conclusions logically from known facts and principles what is this now you have knowledge you already put it into the computer knowledge and you have a base also knowledge base now what is this inference inference is it it analyze this one this knowledge you may ask some question from the computer then computer analyze all these things the system analyze all these things logically right deriving conclusions then they say according to this knowledge base the answer is this one conclusion conclusion that is inference mechanism inference mechanism is you are converting all this knowledge related to the answer and give a conclusion right can you understand that one very easy right the humans inherently have the capability of inferencing so that is natural so if if you have a knowledge if anybody ask question you automatically answer that one by thinking something that thinking part is inferencing right you think these things if you if you can remember all these things you can give straight answer inferencing right in other words it is the process of generating new knowledge based based contributing the new knowledge based on the existing knowledge very simple now existing knowledge means we put it into the computer that is existing one and by running inference mechanism we give new knowledge uh, example uh, accountants knowledge is already gathered and put it into the computer so there are a lot of things in there so uh, someone is coming student maybe a chartered student i mean ask some question the system analyze all these things and based on the existing knowledge they give new knowledge right not as much as possible not full but as much as possible right based on the information available in the computer right that is called inference mechanism i think you can understand the generated new knowledge is stored in the knowledge base once again that knowledge once again put it into the your knowledge base right knowledge base contribute to why why in the stored knowledge of the knowledge base that's i think that is enough for the inference mechanism right then third one is knowledge representation this is very very important before that uh, as the human need knowledge to solve problem now accountant need knowledge that's why you are doing this exam to gain knowledge and show it huh? so human need to knowledge to solve the problem accounting problem that kind of the doctor he need his knowledge the lawyer he need his knowledge so the artificial intelligence system also need knowledge of environment of that particular problem the ai system also need that knowledge so environment then only he can give answer for the student or someone else right therefore remember that without that knowledge ai i can't do anything right how and from where does the artificial intelligence say ai ai system get the knowledge that is knowledge representation <coughs> the knowledge required for the problem solving need to develop and stored in the ai system what is knowledge representation knowledge representation research involves analysis and so and so so you just go through these things i am not reading all these things right we have limited time the if you consider problem solving in this one requires formal knowledge representation formal otherwise you are deviating the answer so the system should identify the correct one correct 
knowledge right therefore system uh, knowledge based system it provide this knowledge and problem requires solving requires formal knowledge representation therefore it needs a conversion of informal knowledge to formal knowledge now informal knowledge what is this is to informal knowledge is your knowledge that is formal but but uh, we are going to take collect all this knowledge this is different different structures different patterns so if you if if you go through your question papers you answer is different than that because different thinking you answer is different than that one why different thinking if you consider this one also those are called informal the informal knowledge is there therefore it is needs to conversion of the informal knowledge to formal knowledge but we have to gather all these things and put it in the formal shape in the computer system because it can't understand these informal things this is difficult right so therefore uh, i will come to this implicit and explicit formal knowledge can be represented in a form suitable to the manage the computer software right if you have a formal knowledge then easy to handle with the computer system ai system right to solve a particular problem by a computer it requires a well defined problem description to process also provide a well defined acceptable solution right so i'm not discussing all these things I'll go to next one uh, this one techniques for knowledge representation what are these question they can ask one question about this one what are the techniques for knowledge, knowledge representation what are the techniques for knowledge representation what are the techniques deeper <coughs> different types of knowledge require different representations right the representation uh, could be a series of the rule then rules semantic net or it could be frame based knowledge what's this they include representation of knowledge through techniques such as logic rules frames and semantic net those are defined in this book if you go through this uh, uh, examples you can understand about these things they, they may not ask about the example in your question paper don't worry about it if you go through past papers they don't ask any question these things right uh, <coughs> a semantic network or a framework frame network is a network which represents semantic relations between concepts so another form of used yes the spreadsheets are yet another tabular representation of knowledge those are tabular systems it's not uh, actually formal systems other knowledge representations are trees graphs and hypergraphs by means of which the connecting among fundamental concepts so then if you come to uh, reason in the uh, reason in the deductions the reasoning mechanism of an ai system is similar to the step wise evolutions that human being does in order to come to logical conclusion about a problem what is this can't understand right yes these are these are the difficult areas to understand i think uh, they may not ask these technical things uh, the reasoning mechanism of an ai system reasoning uh, is similar to the step wise evolutions that a human being does in order to come to the logical conclusion about the problem now now thinking pattern now you are thinking you balance sheet how to how to prepare a balance sheet you are thinking always so like that ai system also want to get step by uh, steps how to how to do this uh, evaluation so that is called reasoning mechanism now you can understand so thinking over the step wise what are the credits what are the debits so so and so you have to identify all these and put it into order step wise 
So that is called reasoning mechanism in AI system, right? You can understand that very simply. So then, similar and stepwise evolution that human body beings does in order, right? That's the, try to understand like that. Otherwise, very difficult, right? Then the algorithms of the research area of AI have been developed even to deal with incomplete knowledge and come to conclusions. That's no need. Knowledge base is incomplete means when the knowledge base does not have all the information necessary to answer some questions. I am not going through all these things. Then robotics. These are motion and manipulation. Robotics. What is this robotics? This is the application of one AI system, for example, application. The field of robotics is closely related to AI, right? If you, if you have a question about the application, you can write down this robotics, right? The robots need intelligence to model human behavior. Same thing, once again talking, once again human behavior, right? The robots may need to perform tasks such as manipulation of objects in the real world, navigating inside a collapsed building or space learning, so and so. For example, think about the manufacturing process of the car. The most of robots are doing now these things. Why? The programs, pro, artificial intelligence programs are embedded into the robots. The robots means that. So they are doing same kind of things always. And fix all comp machines, engines and fix all these things and come out. People are not working there. All robots are not working with there, right? That is all these systems, AI systems embedded into robots, right? That is robotics. Perception and pattern recognition, those are you have to read. This is very important section, the intelligent agent. What is this intelligent agent? Intelligent agent is an entity that acts independently. The agent has a subset of knowledge in a particular problem domain and also has the ability to gain some more knowledge from the environment which it is resides, right? If you go to uh, this, uh, the knowledge acquisition may be done through the sensors which are attached to the intelligent agent. What is the intelligent agent? Now you are going to, for example, There is a web example. Uh, yes, the agent has a subset of knowledge in a particular problem domain and also has the ability to gain some more knowledge from the environment which is resides. Now, th these are small programs, right? It, it has the ability to get more knowledge from the environment also. It takes knowledge from the system and it has get some knowledge from the environment also. Environment is by, by putting some we are asking some questions, no? it, it will go through around and see the things that is called intelligent agent. Agent will go through environment and say something about it. So by gathering more knowledge of the problem environment and using the existing knowledge, the intelligent and will agent will act towards achieving an intelligent goal which imitates the behavior of humans. So this is neural networks. I am not going to discuss neural networks. What is this neural networks? I will explain very simply. What is neural? Now, uh, like one time, uh, maybe last year, last year, yes, they may ask about this question also. This is highly technical. The neural net is an artificial representation of a human brain. Now, now we have our brain. There is a methodology to work. Now, neural net is the similar kind of one, it is an artificial representation, right? Brain that tries to simulate the human learning process. Now, 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 now neural net also try to do that kind of simulation, like human brain. That is called neural net. Uh, how to work it? The word neural network is referred to a network biological neurons. Neuron is biological neurons. In the nervous system, that process and transmit information. Now, if you consider your biological system, if you, uh, you have a nerve system, 
right like that neural network also try to do like that things not 100 percent but try to do that one kind of things very difficult right. The human brain consists of a large number of neural cells that process information. So, it is easy to understand your neural cells you process your data you can add you can deduct anything. So, like that each cell works like a simple processor neural cell right processor. The massive interaction between the old cells and their parallel processing only makes the brain abilities possible. An artificial neuron is a mathematical function method matched to a simple model biological neuron. This inputs then this is the neural model this simple model for the neurons right inputs are there the then some neurons now what is this it that uh, if you go through this figure 5.3 I, I have to go to next next slide next one it's a little bit this one neural network it has inputs coming into the artificial neuron and a single output leaving the artificial neuron this circle this middle part is called artificial neuron right inputs coming then going output when the inputs are received from the other neurons the neuron is focus gets activated and the processing unit calculates. So, these all neurons are combined and try to get a decision and give output right like brain that kind of thing is called this is network now this is a network they may not ask all these uh, explanations, but you have to understand about the neural network that is enough. If you go through past papers these are highly technical uh, artificial neural network is an interconnecting of a group of artificial neurons that uses a mathematical model or a computational model this in this circle it may be the sigma that is mathematical models or statistical models may be applications of accounting this these things are there when you put some inputs it will come out with outputs analyzing all these things. But it, it they that if you go through this neural system each cell will try to work together and give answer there are a lot of cells no? so they they try to combine all these things and put give a good answer right that is that is neural net. Then next one is expert system <coughs> if you go through this uh, these are examples for the artificial intelligence neural networks uh, then uh, earlier ones this intelligent agent then expert system those are those are examples for the AI systems right. Then expert system what is this expert system expert system is an artificial intelligence system that has the expert knowledge of a particular domain now particular domain accounting uh, you have to consider particular domain right but and has the ability to solve complex problems in that domain in that domain right by simulating the th simulating through process of a human expert right it operates as an interactive system that re respond to questions if you go through the last question papers this question is asked maybe maybe last year eh? i have some question papers here express is about express system maybe last year yes if you go through question papers you can understand right uh, they are they were asking about so then you have to explain something about expert system or draw a diagram like this this one at least you have to draw this diagram what is this uh, now human solves problems on the basis of max uh, this kind of expert system has the ability to e ability is to combine facts and heuristic and it does the task of merging human knowledge with the computer power in solving problems. What is this mechanism domain expert then domain knowledge knowledge engineer encode knowledge knowledge base inference engine then expertise. If you draw this one you get some marks right. So, you have to write down this little explanation about expert system 
and at least you have to draw this kind of diagram in your answer. Then examiner can understand your knowledge on this one, but clearly you have to write down the expert system definitions, right. <coughs> if you go through this one, what is this domain expert? The to construct the knowledge base for the expert system and experts knowledge need to be broken down into individual facts, then the behavioral element that the expert uses to come to conclusion should be studied and they need to be converted to rules. Knowledge engineer will get together with a human expert and will perform the task of converting this expertise into facts that rules which are understandable to computers. Now this knowledge engineer is not an engineer, engineer is that is one part of the system. It will convert this one into facts and rules which are understandable to the computer, right. So this knowledge engineer's role is that. Knowledge base then, knowledge base of expert system contains the domain specific knowledge, particular domain, right. Many expert system rep represent this knowledge in the form of rules, some rules. The inference engine includes problem solving skills as I told you earlier, inference they analyze this one, problem solving. Now knowledge engineer will get together and human experts put it all these things into the knowledge base, then inference engine analyze this problem right and the give output. Inference engines includes problem solving skills. It is the module that derives the functionality of the expert system. Can you understand these things? Little bit here, try to understand this. This is very important area expert system, right? They may ask this kind of question in question paper because if you go through past papers, they are, they were asking all this, right? Expert system. Still, we are in the question five now. Then. Uh, this section is important. This one. AI tools and techniques used for problem solving. What is this problem solving? Some some tools given in this book, like search, logic, uh, several different from logic car in research. Please go through this one. They may ask about this question. AI tools and techniques. What are the AI tools and techniques used for the problem solving? What are the AI tools and techniques used for the problem solving? They can ask that kind of question. Then you have to write down these things, right? Very carefully write, write, write down this search, logic, uh, classic methods. I am not going to discuss all these things. Rep repositories. Now, uh, basically at the beginning I told you there are three type of technologies you are going to uh, use in this, this knowledge. First one is AI. The second one is repositories, right. Second one is repositories. Uh, if you go through the re repositories here, 1.2 repositories, that is second one, right. Re repository is a storage location in, in the system. Maybe one university or library or no, not library, one area, location. Location means not physical, but in the system, right? In the system, there is a location which is called repository. This is repository is a storage location in the context of information management through information technology. A repository may have different interpretations. Institutional repository, this is. For example, if you go through this one, it shows it says that a repository established by a particular university or other research institution is known as an institutional repository. In this one, for accounting, maybe lot of uh, lot of uh, documentation in system. So that is a repository. Maybe university, maybe ICASL or like that. So that is institutional repository, right? Then it can be intended to collect and preserve in digital form the intellectual output of an institution. Standards of the accounting standards, huh? like that things, you can put it in these things. 
these outputs may include PhD thesis, master's thesis like that, so many things may be there, right. For example, for you accounting standards, right. So you go through these things that is second one, that is the second technology. The third one is digital library, third, third one is di digital library, right. First one is AI, second one is repository, third one is digital library. It says that digital library, look, this is very simple, all these things are in dig digital form, right. Uh, digital library may con contain digital content which are born as digital or which are actually converted from physical content to digital content later on in a process of called digitization. All these things are in now digital form, those are digital libraries. So, you put it all these things, you can search see very easily, no physical boundary, round the clock availability, multiple access space, easy accessible is those are advantages, no boundaries. You have to type the word, then you can find everything, no round up clock 24 hours you have here, 364 you can log into the system and find all these things, those are called digital library. That is chapter 5, so you will go faster. Next one is uh, knowledge elicitation, what is this elicitation? Uh, I have to go to next chapter, 6, what is this? There are two type of knowledge, but one is tacit knowledge, the other one is expli explicit knowledge. What is this? What is the difference in between? Knowledge elicitation means is the process of converting tacit knowledge into the explicit knowledge. Very simple to understand. What is this? Do not be afraid. This is a very, very simple thing. Tacit knowledge is your knowledge, human knowledge, experts knowledge, that is your experience senior accountants experience that is knowledge his knowledge senior lawyer his knowledge senior doctor his knowledge those are tacit they are knowledge they gain those things by their experience we want to convert these things process of converting tacit knowledge into the explicit explicit knowledge that is called elicitation converting this knowledge into the explicit what is the explicit Tacit, let us go through this one, uh, there are definitions, the tacit knowledge is personal knowledge developed through individual experience and involves intangible factors such as personal beliefs, perspectives and the value system that is your, your as I told you, your knowledge, experts knowledge, human knowledge that is tacit, can you understand easily? So then you are going to convert, what is this other one, explicit? The tacit knowledge is hard to articulate with formal language. It contains subjective insights, yes. Explicit knowledge on the other hand can be articulated into formal language including grammatical statements, words and numbers, mathematical expressions, so so and so. Explicit knowledge can be readily transmitted to others. What is this explicit? That is maybe book, maybe table maybe graph, maybe periodical, maybe standards write down in your, yeah, that is explicit knowledge. Knowledge in your brain and with experience that is called tacit knowledge. Knowledge in that formal things like structured books or tables or something that is called explicit. Now you want to convert your knowledge in your brain into that level, that, that structures, explicit, that is called knowledge elicitation. Can you understand? If you have explicit knowledge, easy to put it into computer, right? So, right. Uh, now, you can understand tacit and explicit knowledge and knowledge elicitation, right? That is knowledge, this section, this section, section 6. Uh, how to do this one? Capturing tacit knowledge. How to capture the personal knowledge? That is very important. There are types of uh, uh, capturing. Capturing tacit knowledge from human being is very difficult to task, very difficult task. So, uh, you have to ask so many questions, you have to interview, the first one is six one interview, interview. Then uh, there, there are a lot of in interview methods and these things, then forums, weblogs and wikis, those are 
some capturing methods. So, you have to go through these things right. What is these forums? There are some uh, computer based forums right. A forum is a virtual, virtual place meeting or medium where ideas and views of particular issue can be exchanged. Different different persons give, if you give us one subject different different experts give different ideas put into the forum, forum is in computer. So, by going through all these things we can make uh, decisions forums then you can capture the knowledge you can capture different different uh, different ideas put it in the forum and capture the knowledge right that is one that is called forum like that there are forums then web blogs and wiki wiki is there a web blog sometimes written as a web blog or web blog it is based it is a website that consists of a series of entries arranged in reverse reverse chronological order everything is there in reverse order last one is in the top right reverse order. So, you can go through all these web blogs and get you can capture the knowledge different different persons put different different ideas in there experts their views then you can convert this 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 you can capture this trusted knowledge right. Those are capturing then please go through all these things they may ask about this now that chapter is very simple knowledge elicitation what is tacit knowledge what is explicit knowledge how to convert this one right it is very simple there may be questions in last paper question papers next section is uh, Uh, data mining yes oh sorry this is next next slide ok chapter 7 is uh, data mining what is this data mining try to understand data mining oh what is mining. So, simply simply it says definition of data mining. Data mining is the process of analyzing large volumes of data to search for patterns and relationships within the data. Basically this is storage, data mining is storage of data, data for the analyzing large volumes of data, huge data set. So, it is not a simple one. So, analyzing volumes of data search for patterns and relations within the data. So, you have to identify the patterns and you have to get some. So, maybe profit, profit patterns or uh, time patterns, lot of things are there. No? So, you have to analyze all these things. This data mining is we are putting data into the storage and doing all these things called uh, data mining, right. This is very big job. Uh, uh, in this section, in this section, they, you have to understand about uh, technologies on data mining. Uh, what are these? Uh, in the data artificial intelligence machine learning statistics and data based systems are used to used as tools for data mining. AI systems the databases statistics those are the overall goal of the data mining process is to extract knowledge from the from an existing data set. Now basically goal is now to extract knowledge from the existing data set. So, uh, data storage is there. So, we are extracting knowledge from the, that one that is explicit. <coughs> the task is the analysis of large quantities of data that you can read all these things and understand. Then very important part is next one knowledge discovery process, knowledge discovery process before that knowledge discovery database. What is this? Data mining is a sub process within the main process knowledge discovery in databases. So, you must have a databases for this one otherwise you cannot do this one, that is storage. Knowledge discovery database is defined as the non trivial process of identifying new potentially useful and ultimately understandable patterns in data right. So, this is very important try to get understand about this knowledge discovery in database. What is this knowledge discovery process? This is last time maybe knowledge discovery process in last December huh? they, they were asking this question last December I think yes 
if you go through past papers uh, I can remember last December I think. Knowledge discovery con concerns the entire knowledge extraction process including how data is stored and accessed. So you have to write down all these steps like selection, the knowledge discovery process can be basically described using the following simple steps. They may ask about what are the steps of the knowledge discovery process, definitely they may ask about it. one time they ask about it, I can't, I can't remember the exam. So what are the steps of the knowledge discovery process? So you have to write down this selection, what is this selection? Then pre-processing, then transforming, data mining, inter interpretation, evaluation. I can remember, so you have, if you have a good idea about it, you can draw this diagram also, right? So what is this selection? This is the activity of selecting a subset of data form, subset of data form from a large data set. Now we have a big data set, selecting, selecting specific required one that is selection of data. So for knowledge discovery process first one is selection. This is very important it, that has been arranged, aggregated over time. So just read this and then pre-processing. The pre, what is this pre-processing? The pre-processing is uh, if you consider a data set that, that data set may be uh, the, that fact that data is unclean, it is not a good one, unclean could be due to incomplete data in disorganized and inconsistent data, noisy data. Eh? So you want to clean all these things that is called pre-processing, unclean data you are going to process clean then that is called pre-processing in cleaning the data. So if you get all these data this is not good for our job. So you have to clean it that is called pre-processing you can understand it. Then transformation. What is this transformation? That data, the data need to be converted to a form suitable for the data mining algorithms. Now data mining algorithms are there. The, if you have a data storage data mine, so there are a lot of algorithms, can functions, those are functions right down in the computer system. So you want to con data need to be converted to the forms suitable for the data mining algorithms. So th this data should be put it into the algorithms. Then so this, this is called transformation process, transforming. You are transforming data suitable for the algorithms to handle that data in a comp uh, compatible manner. The activities such as aggregation, smoothing, normalization, generalization are done in the level. You have to write down basically these things for the transformation. Then data mining is mined using selecting mining algorithms, the tasks such as clustering, clarification, summarization, regression, all kind of analysis are there. Right, all kind of analysis are there, mining process. Then interpretation and evaluation, we have to write down something about the answers, interpretations. That is called knowledge discovery process. Please write down all these things. They may ask about this question, then you have to write down these things. Everything is in the book. Please go through this one. Then there are some models for the knowledge discovery process. What is this? Selection, these things then diagram knowledge discovery process models 721 one time they were asking of this one write down academic research model steps of the steps of the uh, maybe five steps of the ARM right but there are two three methods uh, there, there are two three models the other one is CRISP DM sometimes uh, sometimes uh, you do not understand correctly these things Sometimes you write down this one and other one together, right? Then they don't give marks. So if you if you want to understand the model, then you have to understand the model. Otherwise, uh, mixed academic research model is there. So there are nine steps. Uh, if you go through developing the understanding the application domain, creating a target data set, data cleaning and pre-processing, we will dis we discuss all these things. Data reduction and projection, choosing the data mining task choosing the data mining algorithm, data mining, interpreting my, my, you have to write down this is at least these steps, you have to remember all these things for the academic research model, right. Those are there, please go through, they may ask some question about this one, they can ask. Then next one is CRISP data mining model, CR, that is cross industry standard process for data mining. This is Another method model 
for the data mining discovery process. Business understanding, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, deployment. Just there is a diagram also, actually no need this diagram, but if you can write down these steps in clear manner, this easy to understand, you can read these things and understand. They may ask one of what? these two. Then data mining tasks and related te technology. There are some technologies, different kind of information collections. I am not going to discuss all these things in this detail. Data mining methodologies, please read all these things. Once again they repeat all these things, they did anomaly detection everything. Just read these things, you can understand very simply these things. If you go to knowledge management systems next lesson, I will discuss some questions, that is why I am going fast. I want to show some. Chapter 8 is a knowledge management systems. Basically three systems are there, right. Now you know about what is the technologies, AI and so and so. Then you know about data mining and knowledge, uh, you were discussing about knowledge elicitation, then data mining. The third, fourth one is, that means chapter 8 is knowledge management systems. What is this? There are three systems in this one knowledge discovery system, knowledge capturing system and knowledge sharing system. You have to clearly understand these three, right, three systems in your book. There are, but you have to understand these three. What is this knowledge discovery process system? System. Knowledge discovery can be defined as the process of identifying new tacit or explicit knowledge from data and information. You are discovering the knowledge, new knowledge from data and information may be tacit or explicit that is called need knowledge discovery and uh, you need system for that one of from the synthesis of prior knowledge. Data stored in a databases can be analyzed to identify identify patterns, relations, trends, etc. So everything is here, just go through this one, you can understand. In the uh, the, these systems support to knowledge management sub processes. What is this uh, combination and socialization? So last time they were asking this question, last exam, June, right. So please write these things, that is enough. What is combination? What is combination? Combination is the discovery of new explicit knowledge, explicit knowledge, and socialization is the discovery of new tacit knowledge. Combination is discovery of the new explicit knowledge, right? Simple. Uh, socialization is discovery of the new tacit knowledge, that is our knowledge, new knowledge. These two are the sub processes, combination and social, that is enough for the answer. Knowledge discovery process in this section, the, uh, also called knowledge discovery in databases, tries to discover new knowledge in some application domain. It is defined as the non-trivial process of identifying valid, novel, potentially useful and ultimately understandable patterns in data. This is very important. This process is an iterative and interactive process. What is process? Knowledge discovery process, right. Following are the phases of this process. You have to write down these phases. I think last time they were asking this question also, phases, last time or the previous year right. Uh, selecting the goals of the discovery process, selecting of data, data pre-processing, applying of data mining methods, interpretation of evaluation of the results, utilization of the results. They can ask this kind of question, what are the phases of the knowledge discovery process? Hmm? So just you have to go through these things and write down all these things, they can ask. Sometimes uh, you can draw a diagram like this in next page. 
that is also enough to understand your knowledge. So those are there. What is this? Uh, selecting the goals of the discovery process. Discovery process needs at least some rough concepts of goals. What is your goal? Not in data. What you are going to solve by using this system? That is at least they need small definition so that it can guide the other phases. The final goal can be different one, but but the final goal may be to construct specific tool to be integrated into some product. This is very simple. I try to understand selection of data. Data miner has to select a set of data objects that are to be used in discovery. There are a lot of data, so you have to select the data, right? Then data pre-processing. I already discussed. So right cleaning so applying the data mining to methods correct method you have to apply several alternative methods are available for the actual extraction of patterns so neural nets and so and so you have to you have to apply the correct method interpretation and evaluation of the results then we already discussed utilization of the results that is your knowledge discovery system in this process you have to write down all these things they may ask questions then second one is knowledge capture system, capturing. Second one is the knowledge capturing system 4.2. What is this? Knowledge capture system support the process of capturing either explicit or tacit knowledge that resides within the people, artifacts or organizational entities, right? That is capturing. I, I, we already discussed all these things in brief. So in detail here you can understand all these things if you read how to capture the tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge, right? Some knowledge might reside within the organization and with its employees, yes. So if you go through some records, sales patterns, those are there with their employees. So those are explicit. Some uh, accounting theories in your mind, huh? some experience in your mind that is tacit. Those are some knowledge. So you have to capture all these things into the system. So, however, some knowledge might reside outside the organizational boundaries. Some knowledge, maybe competitors' knowledge, outside. So, you have to get that one also in the system. Outside, boundary which include consultants, competitors, customers, suppliers, so and so. That is outsiders. You have to add that one also into our system, right? Competitors. So, technologies can also support knowledge capture systems by facilitating extra externalization and internalization. What is this externalization? Is the process of ma making tacit knowledge explicit. That is externalization is the process of making tacit knowledge explicit. Your knowledge put it in the explicit. What is internalization? Is the process of understanding and absorbing the explicit knowledge into tacit knowledge held by that is you have so, so many data tables everything sales patterns by using those things you are going to make your tacit knowledge your thinking human thinking right that is internalization you try to understand two different words externalization and internalization right let me ask about that question artificial intelligence systems are most suitable example for knowledge capture systems right ai systems are good for this one those are expert systems fuzzy logic intelligent agents this is also the, there was a question last 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 year I think they were asking about this one, right? Expert system, fuzzy logic. At least you have to write down one or two. This one. The num there are a number of reasons why AI is need to just read these things. You can understand. Expert system once again there. There is another diagram. Remember that two diagrams in this book for the expert system. This is for the knowledge capturing system right the expert systems are there but at least one of these two you have to write down right so the earlier one is for the uh, we discuss about the data mining no yes <coughs> no, no ai a for exa example for the ai ex example for the ai here also same but in uh, different form right uh, sometimes uh, the books also mislead, but uh, uh, but at least you have to write on one, right? The expert uh, system. Then uh, there are some components: uh, knowledge base, inference engine. Once again, those same thing: inferencing, uh, knowledge base, then interface, then in developer interface. Just read these things. 
you can understand all these things. Developer interface the means communication between developer and the expert systems problem solving processes. Development engine the help all these things are there. Fusi logic based systems. Here the definition of the intelligent agent is very good. An agent is a computer system which observes through sensors of the changes in the environment and acts upon the environment using same thing once again. Agent consider environment matters and give answer. Environment using the actuators with direct restriction, yes. Once again same thing repeat. One more thing is uh, here groupware that is also there was a question last time. Uh, now we were talking about uh, knowledge capturing system, knowledge uh, uh, knowledge acquire, uh, acquisition and discovery system, capturing system. Third one is knowledge sharing system. There are three systems knowledge uh, uh, discovery system we discussed and then capturing then third one is sharing. For that one we use uh, what is this knowledge sharing system. Uh, knowledge sharing systems are is here. Huh? Battery, something wrong with the battery, I think. Watch. Uh, battery. The other one is knowledge capturing system. No, sorry, knowledge sharing system. Knowledge sharing systems are used to share knowledge within the organization. Now, now, now system share the knowledge right. The knowledge can be both tacit and explicit now you know that the knowledge sharing system that share tacit and explicit knowledge include group pair, internet, extranet knowledge repositories. Group pair you know that uh, you can understand all these very simple things group pair. Huh? Now you all are doing these things also email uh, uh, then uh, you see this if you go to next page uh, everything is there. Group AI is a software which helps employees to work together collectively while located remotely from each other. You all are working together using email and write blogs, sharing calendars, collective, collective writing, email handling, shared databases, so group scheduling, public folders, those are, those are group AI. Then advantages of group AI are there. So advantages, just read these things you can understand. Then intranet is a private computer network. They may ask about uh, definitions of these things. What is intranet? What is intranet? Intranet is private computer network within an enterprise. That is your one, your company one, not extra, which is accessible only to the employees of the enterprise. Employees can use the intranet to share information among them. You all are sharing, but not outsiders. That is called intranet. If, if you go for the outside, that is called extranet. Next one, next page. Extranet. An extranet is a private network used by a company to securely share part of business, part of business information or operations with suppliers, vendors, partners outside. So, part of our system can use others also that is called extranet, intranet and extranet. You have to understand the, then advantages and disadvantages are there for both. Just write down these things. They may ask about advantages of this extranet. Huh? So, you have to read all these things and then only you can answer. Then future knowledge, this is highly technical, most of students do not understand this part also, maybe 9, within 
one and a half hours very difficult to cover all these yes uh, what is this uh, new new future knowledge management system what are the new future but now this is also not not now future almost there uh, knowledge management systems are expected to be except ex ex expected to benefit from development of information technologies and also changes in focus on knowledge management by business firms the focus will be on following three aspects progress in information technologies shift toward right if you go through all these things there are there are some of the important technologies the soap soap is a protocol so then social information filtering web 2 semantic web these are some technologies important technologies these are highly technical i think once they ask about this one then otherwise they don't ask soap is originally defined as simple object access protocol it's a protocol for exchange of information in you know the http hyper hypertext transfer protocol that is internet like that there is a protocol which is called simple object access protocol those are technical too technical for you I think no? <laughs> uh, it is a protocol for exchange of an information in decentralized distributed environment if you consider this the distributor system so this kind of protocols are using just write down this kind of they, they are not text. social information filtering can exploit simultaneous this, this one simultaneous uh, sim similarities between the taste of different users of recommended just read these things these are some web blog micro blogging right that is all about your syllabus uh, basically you have to understand knowledge based systems uh, uh, the second part is uh, uh, how to how to do this uh, elicitation tacit to explicit knowledge then data mining what is data mining and those, those then come up to uh, basically knowledge management three systems this knowledge discovery system capturing system and sharing systems please read all these things if you go through, can i go through one or two question papers last time uh, 2000 just touch it uh, thirteen december if you go through 2013 December, uh, question is about uh, there is a case to case the use in the four components of KBS knowledge based systems as the basis of for the analysis examine the stability for uh, stability of the four proposals indicated in the case study to be used in KBS. Now I do not read all this case study once again they are asking about the four components of the KBS and relate to the uh, this one. The components are knowledge acquisition, knowledge base, inference mechanism and the other one is uh, knowledge output. Now you want to get these things, understand these things and write down some, some examine the suitability. So suitability you have to write down in that. So next part also same, question 5 is about, next question is draw a semantic diagram of an expert system you have to draw this kind of one expert system that expert system there are two diagrams I told you so one of that one you have to write, write down so both are accepted in this answer so then they are asking about uh, some descriptions propose two uh, tools that may be used for knowledge discovery purpose in each of the banks and justify two tools those are actually from the book, uh, problem reporting or feedback system, document management system, digital library, institutional repository, search engine. You have to write down two of these, right? At least two. Question six is about uh, explain why such a knowledge classification. It is described in knowledge repositories can facilitate knowledge classification. Explain why such a knowledge classification is necessary in today's business context. There is a description, write down. It is des desirable if knowledge repositories can facilitate knowledge classification, right? Yes. Somewhat open ended uh, answers are you just go through this uh, question paper, uh, model answer, and try to un get to understand about these things. These are the questions uh, they ask straight away from the book. Straight away from the book, just read these things. At least we have to read uh, book and give answers. 
if you go through the last time question paper 2014 uh, 2014 June question 4 is explain, explain artificial intelligence and its use what is AI and its use right AI is the science of providing the computers with intelligence that is somewhat closer to human intelligence we already discussed just write down that one and then usage is open so candidate can write down anything usage of the AI I, so many things we discuss so you can write down one of this one at least then second part is describe the following AI tools and techniques searching logic probabilistic methods statistical methods those are in the book just explain at least two three sentences that is enough right next one question 5 last time describe tacit knowledge now you can understand what is tacit just write down that one knowledge embedded in an expert which may require capturing the thoughts and experience of the expert your ex experience your knowledge personal knowledge gained by experience that is tacit so how to convert that one into the explicit that is elicitation very simple right then discuss whether it is necessary to focus on the capturing tacit knowledge in the system required by the NHDS the system related to the case study I am not going to discuss about the case study right. So that is you have to relate that theory part into the case study right as much as possible if you cannot do at least write down the, the parts in the book right you get half mark at least right. So if you cannot relate all these things then just write down the relevant area that is enough but get to get full marks you must uh, relate to the case study that is why case study is there right. So I think these are not question these questions are not that much ex difficult ones if you go through this book just three chapters. So any any uh, yes question 5 then question question 6 question 6 is uh, explain 5 key steps of academic research model uh, ARM uh, there are two models here the, that time last time they were asking about the academic research model at least you have to write down 5 there are 9 steps you have to write down 5 steps right use for the knowledge discovery process. So this time they may ask about other one CRISP right <laughs> I do not know but you have to think about it right. So then uh, 6 next part is uh, part B of the question 6 is describe 3 advantages and 2 disadvantages of using interviews in the data capturing process we discuss interview. So advantages of interviews are flexible tool interviews are flexible you can ask how many questions then excellent for evaluating the validity of information very effective in case of elicitation information regarding complex matters often people enjoy being interviewed that is advantages of interviews that is in the book just write down these things then disadvantages of the interviews what is this very time consuming and costly success of interviews is highly dependent on the knowledge developers human relation skills interviews may be impra impractical due to the location of the interview that is this disadvantage if you go through this uh, these are not that, that much uh, difficult questions 2013 if you go through the previous year paper 2013 uh, June uh, they, question number 4 question number 4 is once again they relate to the uh, this uh, report this uh, case study the part A is uh, part, part A is uh, to identify the business uh, proposed three such IT systems which improve the business functions of the institute explain why you process such the, they, they say this accounting and finance system student registration system that is embedded in the uh, your case study right just identify and write down the, the case study it says, uh, shows all these systems you have to identify and write down right if when you go through the case study you can identify these systems and just write down you get marks but then, then part B is uh, once again knowledge based system part B asks about 
in order to improve the service levels of so and so explain the ways that a knowledge based system can be used knowledge based system once again ask right to explain your answer consider the components of the kbs components of the kbs these are related to the case study but if you can write down these components then you get half a marks right components of the knowledge acquisition knowledge base inference mechanism knowledge output if you can draw a diagram you get more marks with diagram right so they say it's like this potential use the two potential uses of the knowledge acquisition then you have to relate to the case study the potential use of the case now you have to relate these components to the case study and write down you can think about these things please do this once again this last two three papers 2013 june december and last june at least uh, i think all these uh, areas covered by these three papers if you do these things once again i think uh, that's a very good that's enough i think that we uh, i think within one, one and a half hour i think very difficult to cover all these things i touch all these things and you get some idea about this paper and some idea about the area thank you very much for your kind patient i wish you all the best in your exam thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Mathur Arachi. You have done a good job for uh, finalizing the uh, webinar presentation here today. You did the final presentation. Uh, on behalf of the examination division and CS Sri Lanka, I would like to thank all the webinar presenters here this time also today, at, uh, this time also here. And today we are going to conclude webinars for this time. And my request from all the students, as I did every day, work hard, study hard, go through these CS Sri Lanka study packs and get through the, your examination. We all like to see you in the past list after the examination. That is our wish. Thank you all. <laughs>